I hope you'll have your Bibles open to chapter 7 and then we'll move over to 14 so that you can follow along as we explain what John's vision is. So as chapter 7 opens, the four angels of service, the lowest order of angels, are holding back the winds of destruction that blow across the earth as part of the persecution that is to come. But before this time of terror and devastation comes, the faithful are to be sealed with the seal of God. Listen to our opening verses. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. Now this is the first of the seven angels, and we meet the other six angels then in chapter 14. Now remember, in Revelation, it's in symbols. So seven means whole or complete. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now this passage is important for us today. When we maintain our faith in Jesus Christ, God seals us through baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that we are spiritually protected in times of trial and tribulation and persecution. If you and I stay faithful to God and to Jesus Christ, when God's judgment does finally come, you and I and all of God's people will be ready. Our sealing means that we will not be removed from the presence of God, that, but that we will survive spiritually in the eternal heaven near the throne of God. Folks, God's promises always come true. The Roman Empire is in the dustbin of history, but the community of God, the Christian people, is still in this world. Christians are still making disciples of Jesus Christ, and they are still transforming this world. God and his goodness and love will always prevail. God's people will always win the war against evil. Hear that again. God's people will always win the war against evil. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, we just ask today that you open our ears, that we might hear about John's visions and what they have to hold for us. Lord God, you wrote this symbolically. And so today, help us to unpack it and to help us to bring it into our hearts and souls that we might know the purpose you have for us. And so now take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, that become your words, both for our hearing and for our doing. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Now, when you get a chance in the next few weeks, take time to read and reread chapters 7 and 14, because it forms one visionary unit that John had. Those two chapters were kind of interludes in the letter that was written to the churches. These two chapters are powerful. You see, we are assured of our sealing as God's people under his power and authority, but we are also warned in chapter 14 of God's mighty wrath to those who do not choose him. Now in chapter 7, God seals his people, and that number is 144,000. And if you notice, he seals 12,000 from the 12 sons of Israel. That would be Jacob. But if you look closely, you see that the tribe of Dan is not listed, but is replaced with one of the sons of Joseph, Manasseh. 
The rabbis believed that the Antichrist would be born from the tribe of Dan. And if I remember correctly, Dan is the only tribe that stayed east of the Jordan River while the others moved across the Jordan into the Promised Land. Dan was also often connected with idolatry, which you read in Genesis 49, Judges 18, and Jeremiah 8. Well, when God seals the 144,000, all of heaven breaks out in praise and worship. And then someone asks, who are these people? Listen to the answer for the clue to the 144,000. We're in chapter 7, starting with verse 14. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. In other words, these are the ones who have suffered and endured the persecution of the Roman emperor. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now notice what it says here. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, these people who have made it into heaven are the people who on their own chose Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then the passage continues. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. What he's saying here is they have chosen God, and so God will protect them. Some of your Bibles say that he has put his tent over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. Which is referring back to when the Jews were slaves in Egypt. And it refers to us today when we have been freed from being slaves to sin and death. For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Folks, this refers to Jesus who gives us life, and who gives us comfort. When we have been sealed by God through choosing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are guaranteed a place in heaven free of strife, stress, and sin, because our focus will be entirely on the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who is the center of heaven. But there will only be 144,000 witnesses, you say. How am I going to get in? Once again, remember, the numbers in Revelation are symbolic. 144,000 is a multiple of the numbers 12 and 10. And if you remember from our previous messages, 12 means the people of God. And the number 10 stands for inclusiveness. So we can write 144,000 this way. 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. Some amazing things appear. Remember the 24 elders from last week who fell before the throne of God and worshiped? You see, the people of God are represented by the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, that is, those people who lived before Christ, and the 12 disciples of the New Testament who lived after Christ. The number 10 represents inclusiveness, and we have it written three times, which means perfection. So 144,000 perfectly includes all the people of God who have professed faith in Jesus Christ and have remained faithful to God. Therefore, you and I, if we profess faith in Jesus Christ, can be one of the 144,000 witnesses, the people of God. Folks, there is room in heaven for all who believe in Jesus Christ. And now I want you to flip over to chapter 14. John writes this, Then I looked, 
And behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Now remember for chapter 7, that name is the seal of God that protects us. In the ancient world, a mark upon a person could stand for at least five different things. The first being ownership. In other words, we belong to God. The second being loyalty. We have remained faithful to Jesus. The third is security. We are gods in life and death. The fourth is dependence. We depend on God's love and grace. And the last is safety. We cast ourselves on the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And John continues. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpets playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. You see, we can be part of this great choir in heaven singing praises to God. When we declare faith in Jesus Christ, we have been purchased, that is, redeemed through Jesus' death. The penalty for our sins has been paid in full by Christ, and we have the privilege of worshiping in that glorious place called heaven. And our text continues in verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as the first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. These two verses talk about people who have not participated in pagan worship. Now, it was common for each city in the Roman Empire to have a temple to one of the Roman gods. And part of the worship experience was to go to the temple during lunchtime, have a meal from the plentiful food that was offered to the gods, and then have a good time with one of the temple prostitutes. Of course, money was offered by the worshiper for all of this to support the temple. Having a sexual relations with one of the temple prostitutes supposedly guaranteed that man's family good fortune, increased fertility, and bountiful crops from the blessings of the God. But obviously, the Christians and the Jews abhorred this practice. You see, their allegiance was to the one and only true God. Therefore, I think you now understand verses 4 and 5. Christians were those who kept themselves chaste and did not participate in that pagan worship. As we continue in the passage, we come to the last six angels that we first heard about in chapter 7. The second angel mentioned in verse 6 is making a final plea as he spreads the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ for the people of earth to hear. If one doesn't receive the good news and make this final decision for Jesus Christ, then the wrath and judgment of God will follow. In verse 8, the third angel appears. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Babylon was one of the first nations to capture the Jews. And they were in captivity even up to the time of Rome. And so now Rome is referred to as Babylon because it's basically holding the Jews and Christians as captives and persecuting them. Rome's immorality has a great influence on the territories that it has captured. But the Jews and Christians refuse to participate. 
And then in verse 9, the next angel comes declaring, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now the beast is the emperor of Rome, who at this time is Domitian. By this time, the emperors of Rome considered themselves God. They are addressed as our Lord and Savior. And Domitian made sure that a statue or an image of him was erected in each of these cities of the Roman Empire. Once a year, each citizen, slave, and member of the Roman Empire had to go before the image of Domitian, bow down, and publicly declare him as my Lord and Savior. The worshiper would then be given a certificate that would allow them to buy and sell in the marketplace because they were a loyal subject. You see, this certificate was the mark of the beast, the emperor, and it had to be carried with that person. But Christians and Jews refused to bow down to the emperor. They did not receive their certificate and were therefore excluded from the commerce in the empire. Their persecution was an economic persecution, which led many of them to die of starvation and disease. But John is telling them here that if they persevere, they will be honored in heaven. He says, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Those who worship the emperor and the false gods would be sent away from the presence of God when they died. As we continue in this heavenly vision that John is seeing in verse 14, the fifth angel comes out of the temple of God and stands beside Jesus who is sitting on a cloud and who has a large sickle in his hand and says, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Jesus was then joined by two, the last two angels, who also called for the gathering of all of those who had worshipped the beast, the emperor, to be gathered up and and to be put into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. In this vision, God was telling John that he would intervene in the persecution that was taking place under the emperor Domitian. That 1,600 is a multiple of 4 and 10. 4 represents the created order. In other words, the earthly order. And 10, remember, represents inclusiveness. In other words, God's judgment would reach everywhere. God was bringing judgment upon the whole of Roman society for what they were doing to the Jews and the Christians. And God kept his word. One year later, in 96 AD, Domitian died. And the persecution and the emperor worship ceased. Brothers and sisters in Christ, here is what we can understand and learn from all of this. First, God is in control. Did you hear that? God is in control. No matter what trials and challenges, disasters or failures we may have in life, God is ultimately in control. We may have the right to make choices about what we do, but God will control the final outcome. 
God will triumph over evil, and God will turn any misfortune created by us or by Satan into something that will ultimately glorify him. God intervened in one of the worst persecutions of Christians in history, and he eliminated the source of the problem, the emperor Domitian. Second, you and I must remain faithful to Jesus Christ and to his teachings. We have learned from our scripture today that those who remain faithful to Christ throughout their persecution ultimately receive their reward, a place in heaven surrounding the throne of God. And third, there will be judgment. Listen again, there will be judgment. Jesus and his angels will call all men and women to account for their lives, not for what they did or didn't do as deeds here on earth, but for the choice they made concerning their relationship with Christ. Those who choose Christ will be welcome into heaven, and those who don't or make no choice at all, remember, make no choice at all, will, as John says, be thrown into the great winepress of the wrath of God to be forever removed from the presence of God. That is called hell. Revelation is a book of hope for those who remain faithful. But Revelation is a book to be feared if you don't. Choose Christ, and God will seal you with the Holy Spirit. But choose anything else, whether through your pride or self-centeredness or stubbornness, and God will say, I never knew you. What is your choice? What is your choice? If you've not chosen Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you need to make that decision soon. Lord God, let us reread and hear these words again and again. For it will be the choice that we make here on earth that will be our eternity forever. And so, Lord God, help us to choose your Son, Jesus Christ, to remain faithful to him throughout all of our persecution, trials, and tribulations. Because you will see us through it, for you have sealed us as one of your own. And we will be in your presence forever. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.